one of the questions that came in a couple of months ago was, what's your favorite tool? It bugged me. I had never really thought in terms of a favorite tool because I love tools generally. I love the things I can do with them. I love the collectability aspect. I love the fact that I have to have them to feed my family. But I've kind of been grinding on that. What's my favorite tool? And I figured, let's boil it down to 10. Some tools are significant because of where they came from, how long you looked for it, or who it was that gave it to you and your relationship with that person. In fact, as it turns out, several of these tools are treasured because of the relationship I had with the person who gave them to me. There's a significance that a tool has in the value that it brings to your life in terms of either A, the money you make with it, or the pleasure that you get in using it. So utility or value is another criteria that I used for evaluating which of my tools are most treasured. There's the aspect of how well it's made. Quality in a tool increases its value to me. There is the aspect of replaceability related to sort of sentimental value, but if you just could never replace a tool, you don't want to lose it. Therefore, it is more treasured. So with these three or four criteria, you know, sentimental attachment, utility, value, replaceability, quality, I've taken my best shot out of the hundreds of tools that I've got, and I don't think that's hyperbole, of identifying my top 10 most treasured tools, and here they are. Number 10 on my list of top 10 treasured tools, my daily driver's chainsaw. This is a still 044, purchased new in uh, 1993. I don't think it can be improved on in terms of the amount of work that an ordinary man can, can accomplish with this in a day. It's got a 36 inch bar. I like that bar length in second growth timber. A lot of guys like a shorter bar. This little feature of how where the bar tightens and where the chain is tightened was a still innovation which I think now is in public domain. It's brilliant, way better than traditional method. The value of this saw is partly because of the money I made with it when I was logging, but largely it's because of the memories I had have associated with logging with my dad and the number of times that I was nearly killed while I was using it and the number of times that it was nearly killed while I was using it. There are memories of a younger, more vital, more productive Scott Wadsworth and a younger, more vital, more productive Greg Wadsworth associated with this saw that are precious to me. Besides that, you just can't beat a still 044. Number nine, it's a Burke bar. Now some of you who have not used a Burke bar have been a little confused and have had things to say about for crying out loud, it is just a stinking pry bar. Well, you know what? Go ahead and go out and borrow one and do some heavy work with it and see if you still feel that way. It looks elementary. It looks boring. It looks eminently replaceable. But the fact is, I could not buy one of these in Roseburg today. I would have to either A, order it, or B, make it. And if it's a day that I need it, I don't have time for that. There are things that can only be accomplished effectively with a Burke bar. The length, the weight to the strength and length, length ratio, the angle of the bit. Watch the video. The bottom line is, that is a great tool. It, this is not treasured to me because of where it came from. I bought it. I paid 179 bucks. This is not treasured to me because it's not replaceable. I could have another one brand new in my hand in 20 minutes. This is treasured because it is a great tool and I've used one essentially like this, including the previous um, edition of this saw, for 40 years to feed my family. It's perfectly suited for rough carpentry, I've used it most of the days of my adult productive life. I'm good with it. It's dependable. It's got a couple of custom adaptations which you can learn about if you watch any of the videos and I've got two. This is a money maker. This is why I like it. I recommend you own one. Perfect. Stanley block plane. Now, I don't use this very often anymore. In fact, I've never used this one in a, in a production situation. This is on the list for two reasons. The first and big reason is because it was given to me by Neil Groves. Neil Groves was a remarkable old man. He died last year. I miss him. 
he was a man who was as down to earth as it gets, essentially uneducated, essentially raised by wolves, turned himself through dint of hard work and self-education into a gentleman and a helpful contributing member of society. He liked me. He gave me this plane. So that's the big piece. The second piece is, this is well made. You can pay more money for a block plane, but you can't buy one that works any better. So an old school rule that is still valid is that when you set a block plane down, you put it on its edge. The mistake in putting it on its foot is if there's a nail or something, you're gonna nick your, your blade. That's gonna cost you 20 minutes of sharpening time. Now, in an earlier day when wood was always shaped by hand, this was really important. Now it's still valid, but every time I think of these things, I reconnect with Neil and an older approach to woodworking. It's a double-bitted cruiser's axe. And you ask yourself, why would something as simple and elemental as a cruiser's axe make his top 10 list? Partially because it's elemental. This belongs to my dad. I grew up with this hanging in shops, leaning up against the wall, being on the site where we're cutting wood or clearing brush. I used this ax when I was 13 years old, 14 years old, using climbing gear to climb big fir trees and chop the branches off, kind of lifting them to increase the view underneath the trees in the place where we lived. This ax and I go way back. The cruiser's aspect of this ax references cruising timber, which is, of course, a big part of what the history is here in the Pacific Northwest. This is a great tool. And check this out. My friend Ken Jordan restores axes. How about that? Exactly the same axe. When he heard about this axe and saw it and coveted it, and I explained to him that it belonged to my dad and was part of my youth, one day he showed up at the shop with this, a true temper, double-bitted cruiser's axe. They're brothers. One's in his work clothes, one's in his Sunday clothes. Now a framing square in and of itself is an amazing and underappreciated tool to building. This square was given to my dad by his dad at about the time my dad got married. The, the assumption was that every young man needed a framing square. Still a good assumption. So rafter tables and octagon tables, thanks for teaching me that by the way, um, brace tables and a full though, though brief description of how to use the rafter tables. This old boy made by Nichols, major tool manufacturer for a long time in the United States, is probably 70 years old. It means a lot for practicality, for usefulness, for quality, and for the connection with where it came from. Now, I have a new aluminum square that I use on the job. It's lighter, it doesn't get as hot, it's, you know, it's more legible. But when it gets right down to it, this is a tool that I would really, really hate to lose for more than just one or two reasons. You ever seen a wood slick? A wood slick is a tool from a time when timber framing was the way things were built. When mortises were cleaned out and tenons were cleaned up to the shoulder of the tenon, this is essentially a wood plane that you can plane right up to zero with. And you say, well, that's very interesting, Scott. But there's a date on here, I don't think you can see it. L and I J White. Buffalo, New York, 1837. Think of that. And then there's the size of the thing. I've never seen one this big. And then there's the condition of the thing. It is essentially in the same condition it was the day they made it. And then there is the evidence of the forge weld right there between the mild steel or probably wrought iron. Let me say that again. Between the wrought iron and the carbon steel bit. I, uh, and then there is the fact that I use it on the job. Not I will confess in the way it was intended. But occasionally I use it to get in, to slide under something, to pry it up, to dislodge a staple, to help remove, if I've got to do a roof patch, get in around a roof jack. There's a lot of things I can do with this wood slick. But here is the real connection. This was given to me by Roger Rasmussen. Roger Rasmussen was another very good friend. Roger's dead. I miss him. Every time I see this thing in my toolbox, Every time I pick it up to do a roof repair, I think, Roger, thanks, man. This is irreplaceable in more than just one way. So this is my number three most treasured tool. We're in the top third. You don't have much longer to sit through this. Thanks for hanging with me, though. This is a broad axe.
That is a broad, broad axe. Can you see what's left of this touch mark? W.M. Beatty and Sons. And then that nearly obliterated mark of the back end of a milk cow. You can kind of see the hind leg, the hock, the tail, a little bit of the udder. The little bit of research that I've done on this online indicates this was made around 1812. That's even more staggering than the wood slick. So I've been kind of loading my gun mentally about how in the world I'm going to make the handle that this goes, that, that goes in this, because I've got to. Doing a little bit of research, broad axe handles are not necessarily long because they were used with two hands, kind of up close and personal. I can't wait to hew something. This is what was used to make beams before sawmills. But now we get to the meat of the matter once again. Another mentor of mine who's dead too soon, Bob Hovenden. This belonged to him and his dad. And I hesitate to assign ownership to his granddad, but it wouldn't surprise me. A broad axe like this is an iconic example of a time when it was hard to make things. When the things we take for granted, like, oh, let's go down and buy a 4x6, was, a, was an idea that would take days to bring to fruition. I intend to handle this. I intend to polish it up. I intend to make this kind of a centerpiece of the tools I have that connect me with people who have had the biggest impact on my life. Thanks, Bob. You're looking at number two. Now, I don't call it number two because obviously there's an indication there of a metaphor that absolutely does not apply, but this is my 200-pound Chambersburg General Utility Hammer. This was the subject of the first video that we posted on YouTube, so I guess that attaches some significance to it for me. This is my second most treasured tool because it absolutely fills all of the criteria related to being important to me. It's useful. This power hammer will do things that a lot of power hammers won't. It does things that I have to do if I'm going to be a blacksmith. It is quality. Chambersburg was one of the premier um, machinery manufacturers for a long time. This thing is going to last, taken care of, it'll last several lifetimes like mine because nothing is going to break on it. It's beautiful in that way. It is treasurable because it is almost irreplaceable. Now that's a little bit, okay, that's not quite accurate, but it's almost accurate. It's hard to find a Chambersburg General Utility Hammer. It's harder to find one in a 200 pound weight class, which is a perfect all around weight for an artist blacksmith. And then we get to the last criteria, which is a common theme in, th in uh, the dimension of tool ownership that is most important to me, and that is, Henry Rebman found this for me at an auction in San Jose, California. He went to the auction and bid on it for me. He brought it back to his place for me. He held it until I could get down there. He loaded it for me. Henry facilitated this for me. Henry's another mentor. Every time I walk up to this, I think, thank you, Henry. So for every reason that is part of my calculation, this is number two. Are you ready for my favorite tool? In fact, favorite is too weak. Treasured is the only adjective for this tool. It is the most unique, it is the most useful, it comes with as powerful a sentimental attachment as any of the rest. It is the highest quality tool that I have in the shop. It is the most irreplaceable, it is iconic of the most worthwhile efforts, it has come to underpin and undergird the craftsmanship outlet that is right now most satisfying to me and will continue to be most satisfying to me until I die. It's the mother of all shop tools. It is the center of this shop and it in fact underpins and was the catalyst for this YouTube channel. It, it can't surprise you that it's my 448 pound hay button anvil. Check out the video of that title and you're going to understand better why this is the possession that is under my control that would hurt the worst to lose. Separate from my human blessings, my family, my friends, those that I associate with who mean so much to me in my life, separate from that, this is the thing that I treasure the most.